Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are all going ghost hunting. Yes, pick up your PKE meter and strap on the proton pack. We are going on a paranormal investigation. But not just with me, you'll be glad to know. It would be quite rubbish if I was leading it. I've got some experts joining me on the show today. Two good friends of mine from the Welsh investigation team, Cymru Paranormal, who I hope will become regular guests on this show. But what I'd like to do on this episode is to pretty much look at the basics about how people go about investigating ghosts in a responsible manner. And so what equipment do they use? How do they prepare? How do they enter somebody's house without terrifying somebody? And the big question I think most people who are inspired to go ghost hunting must ask is that, is it anything like we see on the television screen and the cinema screen is i mean we've all we've all seen these tv shows where every episode is like the blair witch project or is it a bit more mundane in reality is it all just a bit well a bit boring well to answer those questions and more are going to be my good friends sarah and leanne from cumry paranormal now we first met at an ASAP convention many years ago. Now, ASAP stands for the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. And they're a charity, a research charity, an education-based charity, and they investigate a lot of similar subjects to what I talk about on this podcast. The big difference being is that they are, as the title suggests, they are scientific, scientific study, whereas I just waffle on for a bit and do do my own thing but i was at a convention in bath university i was there to give a talk or or to give a lecture i guess in the university i was there to give a lecture on victorian ghosts camry paranormal were also there no camry paranormal were there as members and this is one of the great things about them as a team is that they are members of ASAP. They are trained by ASAP to do things correctly. So this isn't just a bunch of people who've been inspired after watching a television show, say, and they've just said, look, let's just go out and start ghost hunting. No, they've done it properly. They've done it. They've done it the hard way, but they've done it the correct way. And since then, they've become very good friends. They've been kind enough to invite me along on their investigation. So I've been there overnight in these places with them. And they've also joined me at many, if not if not all of my book launches, or certainly all of my ghost book launches, which I can't thank them enough for. And that is why when anyone asks me, can I help them out and point them in the direction of anyone who can seriously investigate these things, Cymru Paranormal are always the first people I turn to. And they're also lovely people, which helps as well. So on that note, let me try via the magic of the internet to connect the three of us now on this podcast. So here goes. If this works, welcome to the show, Sarah and Leanne from Cymru Paranormal. Hi, Mark. I'm Sarah. Hi, Mark. It's Leanne. Hello, both. Now, let's get straight into this one with a nice difficult question for you both paranormal investigators if that's the right words to use i know people use different words we could just say ghost hunters but paranormal investigators people are probably they probably have their own ideas in their minds of what that involves about what people do they've seen most haunted or they maybe they've seen films like the conjuring how does that represent what you really do? Do you think it's fair to say that what you do is similar to what people have seen on the TV and the big screen? I told you it was a tough Um, one to start. Wow, yeah. I mean, everybody would like to think that, uh, you know, every night that we're out, it's like the conjuring and it's not. (laughs) Uh, In in reality, it it simply isn't. What we do is... Uh, how would you explain it? We're sort of looking for the rational uh, 
um, explanation as to what is actually happening. So is it normal what's what's happening? And so we're sort of discounting things as they go along. Do we have, do we, do we encounter, um, you know, controversially Annabelle dolls or, or items like that? Who, who's to say that that's not real? I've not, you know, seen her. I've not encountered her, but you haven't got an who, Annabelle doll at home. Who's to say that that's not real? And it's just that we haven't experienced anything like that because, you know, if I were all of a sudden tomorrow to experience something like that, who would believe me? That's the difficulty. So what we are trying to do is to investigate, have um, controls in place so that if anything were to be experienced, that we could say, well, you know, this blah, 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 blah. So it was unquestionable, the evidence that we would have. Now, in reality, is that exciting? Because we're putting all of these controls in place. Most people would perceive that as no, but the TV doesn't, you know, the TV is selling something, isn't it? The TV doesn't want to have an hour programme or a two hour uh, movie of just um, some people sat in a room just talking, trying to see if uh, an experience that has happened to somebody is going to happen to them. It's not going to sell any movies and it's got, not going to, you know, get people watching on the TV again, is it? So um, I would say, no, it's, it's not like what is seen on the screens unfortunately unfortunately i say i'd probably run out of the building if it did yeah i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing really but uh, exactly. yeah so, so in reality then is it is it fair to say it's a lot more hard work as well yeah it is um you know because now there is so much emphasis put on on evidence and it's really important that even though it's it's, it's serious and we take it serious that we do have fun and you know, you you think about when we get reports in. So when we've been invited to, to places um, to investigate and, you know, we've not made the decision, you know, like that, oh, wow, we've been offered this place to investigate, let's go and do it, because we've refused places to investigate because of, of completely different reasons that it wasn't the place for us. We didn't really get the idea that um, it was genuine, uh, dare I say. And so, you know, if you get a report, um, say, for example, you're in a hotel and it's the housemaid is cleaning the, the bedrooms of a morning when a guest has checked out and there's been a number of experiences that she's had and it's, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, sunshine. We're not going to sit in that room, are we, at, you know, midnight, uh, with all the lights off, hoping that we're going to replicate what has been experienced or reported a number of times. So, uh, you know, you've got to look at it that way when we're investigating. So it's, it's, it's very different. We're trying to replicate the human experience. Is that ever going to be possible? Because, you know, they're human experiences, aren't they? They're what somebody has experienced. And um, can that be replicated? Because that person's experienced it for a reason. So would, if I experienced something, would Leanne experience something? We, well, we did have a similar experience, didn't we, Leanne? But, <laughs> but, yeah. So yes, that is the answer. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's a million dollar question and I don't think anyone's truly got the answer, to be honest with you, Mark. But I, I guess at least by replicating, while that might not prove, I don't know, they did see whatever they claim to have seen, it could help to disprove something, couldn't it? Because if you go back, say, at the same time, in the same place, and you see maybe the light cast in a shadow in a certain way, then you could say, well, actually, looking at it in hindsight, that is probably what happened. Absolutely. You're, you're spot on. And, um, you know, we've done an investigation. Leanne and I were involved in a, an, an investigation, which actually rose more questions in the end than it did answers. And, and one of the reports was this um, hooded man um, or hooded figure walking across a room and um, it actually was the light shade and it was the street lights outside and when you were in the room at a certain point and you looked at the light shade that's what created this shadow and so it was it was a normal explanation there wasn't anything paranormal in that it was just normal everyday 
uh, lights and lights. So it was, you know, a lampshade and a street light. Uh, and that was all it was. But you, also, you still did your job though, didn't you? You still... That's yeah. And, that, and that's more, it's more detective work yeah. Than, yeah. than being a Ghostbuster yeah. then, isn't it? It's more the other end of things. Yes, yeah. And that, that's sort of similar to, you know, investigating now is, is quite similar to what the police are doing when the police are investigating crimes, etc. It's, it's taking the, those theories and, and working through that, which is quite similar to what, you know, paranormal investigators are actually doing. You know, so um, the, the, there's quite some parallels there. But again, you know, we investigated this building for for a number of weeks, and you know, it, we we did enjoy it. You know, um, did we get any true answers at the end or any solid evidence? No, we didn't. There were a couple of personal experiences that people had, and again, how do you rationalise that? Per, the, you know, the personal feeling that somebody's had you, you can't really rationalize that really mm. you know if somebody's got that personal feeling they're they're experiencing that um for a reason so um that's the difficulty you can't you can't prove that and you can't really disprove that unless it's an electric shock then you know exactly yes. and, that, and you know and that happens electricity in buildings does impact on people so and that has happened and you know, Leanne has, has come across that where electricity was in, affecting somebody, wasn't it, Lee? Yeah, there was um, the, the, the wiring in the building was actually um, in, in a big arch in the hallway. So you had a uh, sort of consumer unit, consumer unit on one side and the meter and it sort of arched all over the top of the, the ceiling. So every time they walked into the hallway and stood in the hallway, you know, putting their coat on, putting stuff in their bag they were feeling really overwhelmed and um we, when we investigated it was just it was literally the electricity that was affecting them it was giving them headaches it was making them feel um just awful all the time and they just they just presumed that their, their whole wave was haunted it wasn't it was just poor electricity circuitry really that sounds quite dangerous in a way doesn't it having electricity mm. that can cause that much well, I think it can cause headaches and things and people just from being there. But uh, mm. I, I don't know what's worse. Like I might rather the ghost rather than uh, having electric <laughs> causing that, that effect on me. So, so when, you, when you go into, as, as you mentioned there, you go into the houses and, and it's not like people see on TV in the middle of the night with a shaky video camera. How, what, how do you approach that? What's the sort of the setup with the starting point, I guess? The starting point, the starting point would always be to obviously interview the, the client um, and find out, you know, exactly what's been happening and when. Uh, we usually ask them to keep a diary of things that have been happening. Um, and then we try to meet up with them um, where possible to obviously um, go through the location and where these experiences have been happening. Um, once we do decide that it's something that's, you know, valid and, and worth investigating um, we put a team together and then we we come up with a plan of where we're going to locate different things depending on the experience so um, you know if it's something that's visual then we probably put cameras up uh, in general terms we try and put cameras up anyway um, but if it's something that's being heard then obviously there'll be recording devices there as well so it depends really on what the experience is as to what we set up and then we would try to replicate the sort of experience, the time of day, um, the situation that's going on wherever possible, uh, and then try and correlate the, the data afterwards then and, and see if there's anything we can come up with. Now, you, you've bitten me to it in a way. I mean, I was going to ask about the equipment at some point. Um, and obviously, you, you need equipment to, to capture sound and visual things, whatever it may be. Now, there are a lot of companies out there who claim to sell ghost hunting equipment, for want of a better description. Where do you get your stuff from? Is it the kind of stuff you can just buy in, in an Argos catalogue or is it very specialised equipment? We, we don't really... Um, you can't really get a ghost meter as such or something that's going to detect ghosts. Um, you know, there, there are lots of uh, companies out there that, that do sell those items um, and I'm sure they're, they're fun and lots of flashy lights and beeps and things like that. Um, because none of these things are really... Um, tried and tested you know you can't really say that anyone has invented a ghost detector so what we stick with is such stuff that you can 
very easily purchase um, cameras, camcorders, uh, little GoPros, the just being able to record on a little voice recorder, things like that. So n- nothing has to be particularly expensive uh, and it doesn't have to be particularly specialist. You know, you can go really high end uh, with 3D imaging cameras, FLIR cameras, uh, thermal imaging, stuff like that. But you don't have to spend a lot of money to be able to investigate, really. You just need to know how to um, work out what you've picked up, really. And do, do you think the the old school approach of, I'm thinking of someone like Peter Underwood, and I've totally, totally forgotten the quote, but it's along the lines of, as long as you've got your senses and a pencil and a bit of paper and a candle, you can go off and do it. Could, could people do that now or do they need a little bit more technology nowadays? No, a lot of our investigations take place just with um, pen and paper. We, we've got reams of notebooks that we use. Um, uh, so all, all our investigators would always be armed with pen and paper. Um, the cameras are there for obviously correlating other things. Um, so if somebody thinks they've seen something and they note it down, then the camera's nice to have to sort of back up that experience because as everybody um, is always looking for um, is the evidence so it, pen and paper personal experiences um, don't give you a lot of evidence unfortunately but cameras can give you a lot more uh, same with voice recorders uh, you've got a lot more hard evidence with that anyway sounds more like being a journalist really walking around with a pen and paper and stag or stacks of notebooks here all over the place but uh, with the um you said about the hard evidence there. I mean, I guess that's capturing photographs and things. Do you do you have any particularly good examples of that yourselves that you think, wow, this is the best ghost photo ever? Or have you not reached that point yet? Uh, we have got one or two. Some of our some of our catches we have to be very careful of because we do have confidential investigations, so we can only <laughs> divulge so people. many things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we have got one or two there. We've got voice um, voice recordings, which um, you know we can't explain them. It's the voices that come through, and none of the voices that of the people in the room. Um, we are a very small group, um, so we know each other very well. Uh, we know who's talking and the funny noises people make. Um, you know, sometimes when you're completely unaware. Um, so in the middle of the night, you know, if you're investigating, we were aware if somebody else is talking. Um, but the voice recorders can pick up things that um, are completely unexplained. You know, we've had animal noises. Um, we've had really uh, strange voices come through. Um, same with some pictures. We've had pictures that we, we just can't explain. Um, so, yes, yeah, it proves very interesting sometimes, but we're always searching for that sort of ultimate piece of evidence. And have these bits of evidence, and I, I should, rookie mistake you, I should have asked you both this at the start, but wh- when you began this, I don't know what your beliefs were, but has any of this evidence changed your beliefs at all? Were you more skeptical? And since doing this for some time, you've become more open to the idea or maybe the opposite as, as a result? I think for myself personally, I've, I've always believed there has been there's something out there Um but I've always been very open-minded either way. So um, I've had personal experiences that I can't explain. Um, and I've had other experiences that now I am able to explain. So I, I suppose I've started to become a little bit more skeptical, but then I, I also think that I'm just a little bit more aware of things that can be uh, easily explained nowadays. Yeah. Is that the same yeah. for you, Sarah? I, I would agree with that. Um, um You know, certainly over uh, the years, I've become slightly more sceptical. Can uh, what I I sort of find out because of investigating and and like Leanne said, you you become more aware of you know what what is explainable, etc. But I I just can't believe that the energy that we have within our bodies that keep us going that um you know when we pass over that that energy just dissipates and it just goes so yeah um open-minded but then i do sometimes sit there and you know and i think oh go you know um we're sat here is anything going to happen or if somebody's talking to me about um you know uh 
different things and and you know sometimes it does go through my mind oh really um but you know that's that's wrong because it's it's not about judging because i've had personal experiences that i haven't been able to explain in in places uh and i've had personal experiences that have been able to be explained um you know the ones that i haven't been able to explain well you know and i've been back to these places and i've tried again and again and again uh, would i ever have that experience again but one day i would like to have that experience again just to sort of really go through my mind and think oh right okay uh so i had that so let's do it this way you know let's you know how you react afterwards because uh, there was certainly one exp- personal experience i had that um, it really did shake me up. So if that happened again, would I react like that? You know, I didn't scream or anything, but it certainly did sort of shake. And it shook me up for quite a few weeks afterwards. Uh, And this was a building that we were going in weekly, weren't we, Leanne? And Leanne and I had similar, the experience sort of simultaneously, uh, almost not identical, but very similar. And the way that it happened in the way that we were stood to what I had experienced and what Leanne had experienced would have, uh, could have happened the way we were stood with each other. So, uh, you know, um, I think being open-minded is, is key really, but uh, yeah, I am, I am more skeptical. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, because it sounds like you're not both, you're not skeptics, you're just more skeptical. And yeah. Do you find, I mean, I, I found when, when I spoke, speak to people after being on a, an all-night investigation, they, you know, they think you're mad. They're like, look, you sit there, nothing happens, and it's cold. What, what is wrong with you? Do, do you find that maybe because you've both had experiences yourselves, that kind of drives you on in a way? So when you are sitting there thinking, I'm cold and it's late and I want to go home, but that, that drives you on in a way, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, totally. And... Um you know sometimes yeah when it's when it's late in the night and uh, or early in the morning we should say and and you are feeling a little bit tired and you know you've set up all of your controls and you've got your cameras covering um exits and entrances and nobody you know nobody's come into that room and what have you and then you clear everything away and you sort of sit down exhausted and you think oh you know and then something happens and everything's been put away is that happening because then you're at a, a sort of a tired state although i've got to say that i go through a little bit of a lull where i feel exhausted but then all of a sudden you sort of peak up a little bit i don't know how leanne um goes but yeah certainly then coming home you've got a little bit more adrenaline and then i, I can never go straight to sleep when i first come home and yet you know maybe three hours earlier i could have gone to sleep on a you know a clothes peg Yes, yeah, you get that second wind, and yeah. is, is that the yeah. same with you, Leanne, or are you drinking Red Bull and things to keep going? And <laughs> usually through the night, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we, we, I think I think one particular experience that Sarah's talking about um, with relation to that is where we've been packing up. Uh, we've had a relatively quiet night in what's previously been um, a, quite an active location. And we've gone there for a return visit and it's just been really quiet. And we've wondered, you know, what, what's different about tonight? And it's sort of become a little bit sort of tedious. And we've started packing away and all of a sudden everything is happening and we haven't got any cameras. Yeah. So it, it's just, it's back to personal experiences again. There is one location that myself and Sarah have been in as well, where at the end of the night you go out and you close the door and the location locks itself and we've had an agreement from the owner that we just go through the door and we we close it at the end and on two occasions um we've had sort of a a quietish last hour and we've said okay let's let's pack up now let's go and just as we're closing that door and the last person's coming through we've heard something and we can't go back in and that's happened on two occasions right at the end and then so do do you think in a way because i've I'm not going to name names, but I've seen TV shows and nothing happens. And they say, and just after we packed up, all hell broke loose. And there were things flying off the shelves and sounds and everything. So in a way, I mean, I was just being cynical and thinking, yeah, right. But could, could it almost know what you're up to, whatever it is, and be waiting for you to sort of 
turn your back and go home before doing something? I, I think so. I mean, you know, let's let's be honest now. If somebody said to me, Sarah, I want you to perform for me to tonight, I'd be like, yeah, right. Mm. You know, um, and I'd, I'd like to think the devil in me that if I was dead and came back as a ghost, I would sit there and think, yeah, you think you're going to get something off me? <laughs> you Not know. until you pack up that um, camera. Uh, yeah, and, um, you know, I, I think there's, there, there is something to be said that, you know, they don't perform. Uh, it's, it's certainly, it's at their, oh, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, but, uh, you know, they are the ones that are in control. So uh, when you've got everything put away, that's, that's when things will start happening. And, and that does happen. That happens a lot, you know. Um, I, I've been in the same building that Leanne was just talking about. Again, was it my eyesight? Who knows? But uh, there was nobody in the building. Um, I'm outside. I looked in through the door and a black shadow ran past the entrance of the door inside. Uh, now you've got security lights on. Hey, how am I going to prove that I actually saw a black figure or I didn't see a black figure? But what I saw for that split second, I sort of like went, Oof. so yeah, um, I don't know. This is where it's really key that when you investigate somewhere, you need to go back. It's not about a once only investigation. To do a proper investigation, you need to be continually going back. You need to be building up. You need to be discounting. Then you really get the feel of a place. You know the movements. You know how the floor settles in the night, how the, the windows may make a noise or rattle. You get to know everything about that building. And then you can really focus on, on what is going on in there and what is different. And... For me, can I tell you what the, the probably the spookiest is, is actually going into a building and it is so quiet. And we do have that. We have that, don't we, Leanne? Where we're going to a building and it is so quiet you could hear a pin drop. So, sorry, Sarah, can I, can I just clarify uh, qu quiet uh, for, for myself and anyone listening? By quiet, do you mean you, you can't hear things with your ears or do you mean there's no activity quiet? No, it's just like... It's, it's just really quiet. Mm. So apart from you talking, you, there, there's sort of like this silence across the entire building. And, you know, if you actually turned everything off in your house, including your electric lights, you know, your houses, our houses, they make a noise. Mm. So, so we would hear noises naturally uh, in, in our house. We'd hear you know, creaks and sounds naturally. But when you're, when you're in some buildings, you have this, it's an uneasy sort of silence. It's like being and, in a vacuum, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, that's really hard to explain because it's, it's just too quiet, far too quiet. So we're talking no, no birds singing, no bats flapping, no. not that you do bats flapping, but no, no sounds no. at all. Yeah, and, and, and nothing whatsoever. And how, how, how would you explain that then? Is that, is that a, a something supernatural or? I, I don't know. I, I, I you know, I, God, if I had the answer to that, I, you know, I, I'd like to make a bit of money from it. But um, You wouldn't be talking to me right now. You'd be on telly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's just, it's, it's just really weird. It's, mm. it's, it's, I wouldn't say it was suppressive, but it's just quiet, just really quiet. Um, and I find that, I find that, like, really strange, you know. Um, there's one building that Leanne and I go into, and, you know, it's an old building, and it, it says your creaks, you know, and, and all the different sounds. And sometimes we've been in there, and it's been, like, quiet. Not a creak in the floorboard, not a, not a bit of water going through the pipes, just, like, dead. <laughs> yeah. Does that then correlate with activity later in the night when it's that that dead that quiet you think right we're, we're, we're going to be in for a good night here well no because sometimes it just stays quiet all night oh so that, that's it then so it's all quiet night, all and night. no more no all less. Night. yeah and and it can be just at that particular moment you're actually leaving the building and then you hear something and you can't get back in sometimes that actually happens midway through the night as well doesn't it you get you know you can have all sorts happening at the beginning of the night and then there's like a, like a, a switch 
it just suddenly goes so eerily quiet that there's there's nothing going on there's nothing happening there's no sounds there's just it's just like a complete dead silence and that's usually a point where we think okay this is different maybe we need to sort of build up the energy in here a little bit and you know so we have been known to get get singing yeah. and jokes singing. yeah we've been singing and we've been telling jokes and um just trying to sort of liven up the atmosphere a little bit and then sometimes we've had responses coming through um other times we've just decided oh that's that's it for the night um and then packing up obviously we've woken up whoever was there so what what songs do you sing to the ghosts if there's any oh. ghosts well, all sorts, really. A um, couple of Welsh hymns going on sometimes. A bit of sauce fun bar. <laughs> and better we are at town. Yeah, indeed, yeah. <laughs> there we are. Well, if there's any, any ghosts from Llanetli, they'd pop right up, wouldn't they, if they heard that one? Yeah, yeah. And we've got um, one of our investigators, uh, she's um, uh, a fluent Welsh, Welsh speaker. Mm-hmm. And um, she's fantastic to be with us in in some locations because... You know, bearing in mind that certainly if we go slightly west, yes. um, you know, they were all Welsh speakers. It was very rare to have an English speaking person. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's when you're you're sat. So when we do the investigations, we, we don't sit there quiet, as you know, Mark. We don't just sit there in the room waiting to listen to a sound. Oh, did you hear that? You know, we are we're chatting, you know, we're we're talking about different things where you know, trying to be normal and, you know, carrying on and getting things going. And, you know, if um, Lisa's with us and she can be talking Welsh, etc., you know, that can sometimes get a little bit of, of sound going in the building. Hey, what it is, it's, you know, it could be anything, Mark, um, yeah. you know, but certainly having a Welsh speaker on the team is uh, does pay dividends on time. Well, maybe I should have told you sooner that I speak Welsh myself. Think of all those times. Oh, I could have you out yeah. when, and you, you're right. I have been. I think the last one was in Larne, but I, I've been on investigations myself down west. And I mean, you, you talk there about language and speaking. Again, again I, I hate to use these examples from television, but it, is it like people on television literally talking, shouting out in a room, or do you, do you use psychics or mediums, or how how do you communicate using language? Well, well, we don't call out. Um, we we have natural, you know. Don't get me wrong. Many years ago, we used to sit there saying, "Is anybody with us? You know, are you male? Are you female? You know, and 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 all of that. You know, tap five times if you can hear us. Yeah. We we don't do that now. Um, we just have natural conversations and and acting as normal as possible. You know. When, when somebody has an experience that they've reported, they weren't sat there saying, is anybody here? Yeah. Can you knock five times if you can hear me? They weren't saying that, were they? When they had whatever, whatever happened, that's not what they were doing. So, um, you know, if somebody came along and, and we interviewed them and they said, well, yeah, I was sat there and I kept on calling out, you know, somebody here, somebody here, and then next minute I got smacked in the face, then we would... You know, when we thought that was quite viable, and obviously that's what we would try and do uh, when we were investigating. But in reality, that's not what people are reporting. You know, they are they're sat in in an office and they're just going about their business, answering the phone. You know, talking to their colleagues. So why would we sit in that room? Again, with all the lights off, saying, is anybody here? Can you give me a sign? Um, so, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do that. So that's cool. And what about the sort of the, the Ouija board end of things? Is all, all of that stuff's out? Or? Well, no, no. We, uh, you know, we, we do have that. We've got a medium on our team. Right. Um, and again, you know, we have, we have, when we've gone as a team to investigate places, you know, like a, the, a, the larger group of us, not a confidential investigation, then we've split into two separate teams. And we've had your scientific investigators and we've had then your more traditional uh, means. And they've taken off the, the Ouija boards and, and things like that. And what we've tried to do is to try and correlate throughout the evening then against our notes, anything that we may have 
have picked up to what they have picked up. And again, you know, the Ouija board, there are lots of controlled methods that you could, on a scientific point of view, use a Ouija board. Uh, but it's all, again, it's all about your backing up and your evidence, etc. Uh, because, you know, there is a belief that it's, it's our energy that moves the glass or the um, spectra, etc., um so you know you can back all of there's lots of different ways you could do it you could turn your board upside down have a glass table film underneath you know there's lots of different things that you could do so um yeah as as a team we have got that we've had that we had them made for us so um we wouldn't take them into somebody's house to investigate and we wouldn't take it into a business to use to investigate because they're they're completely different to the other side um so yeah well that's and i i do like the fact that you split into two teams you've got the scientific team if that if that's the right description and then the the psychic team or whatever you want to call the other guys like uh like splitting up the x-men or something and do you you compete as well to see who's got the best stuff or is it all is it all teamwork oh they they win every time they do of course they would yeah yeah uh, yeah what did you get we didn't get anything oh what did you get hold on i'll go through my notepad <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah they'll, they'll, they'll shoot me for saying that <laughs> <laughs> yes yes well uh, it's, too, yeah, it's too late now know, i've recorded it exactly but you know at the end of the evening have we all enjoyed the evening yes absolutely we have so um <laughs> yes. you know and and sometimes we'll get somebody who will who would be on the traditional team and then say, oh, actually, can I go and swap? So that that's quite good as well. And, uh, you know, it's about respecting everybody's different beliefs, isn't it? It's, it's about having mutual respect. Yes. Now, I, I know a lot of what we've spoken about and what, what you were saying about the way you guys do it scientifically uh, comes from ASAP, which might not mean much to many people listening, but you've been sort of trained to do this ethically i think is the correct way of putting it to, to do this in a way which you know doesn't upset people doesn't upset homeowners you, you don't go in with a ouija board for example and scare people amateurs who maybe they might be listening to this and thinking do you know what i'm going to do that i'm going to go out and do what they do are there any sort of words of of warning in a way that think things people really shouldn't do if they're going to attempt this well if i if i start and then hand over to leanne um so there was one um one case from from a group we don't criticize groups everybody does things different but from an ethical point of view there was one one group who had investigated somewhere where there were young children and told the family to move out of the house for a couple of weeks whilst they investigated because it was safer for the children now that in my book is unethical they they actually frightened the family in their own home and it isn't about frightening, you know, if ever there was one day there was conclusive evidence that there was life after death, it's about actually those two worlds living in harmony together and having a respect for each other, not about being, not about frightening people. So, uh, you know, it's just about being mindful. Yes, you will always have somebody who says they're experiencing something in the house and no matter what you say to them, they will always believe that it's paranormal. And that's entirely fine. That's fine. As long as, you know, they're accepting of that. But it's just about being, I think, people careful of what they're saying, who who they're dealing with. And again, not frightening people. People live in these houses. And, you know, some people are genuinely scared. And as a group, you know, we do pride ourselves on not wanting to frighten people from being in there. You know, your home is supposed to be a safe place, isn't it? So um, just really, I, I just wish everybody would be mindful of, of who they're dealing with and, and how they could be coming across and, and their language that they're using. So I, cause I imagine, you, you, you're right, I mean, they, they wouldn't contact you in the first place if they weren't concerned in some way about this, would they? So, yeah. so that you have to be, you know, you have to bear that in mind. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So hopefully anyone listening will be careful if they do go out and do it or, or do it with a, a proper group like you guys and they can be shown how to do it. So, I mean, There are other parts to that as well, Mark, where um, the, there are obviously insurances that are needed um, for going into certain locations and, and places like that. And, and if there was ever a, a sort of safeguarding issue, you know, we would we'd be very, very careful. We were all 
DBS checked and things like that. So there are other sides to it as well that you need to be very, very careful of. It's not just a case of sort of turning up with a camcorder and doing an investigation because you need to think of the safety of the investigators as much as the safety of the, the client um, and their property that you're going into. Yes, yeah. Is, is there also a way of, I mean, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't just get someone off the street to come in and put a new roof on your house, for example. You, you'd check them out first in some way. Can, can people do that with paranormal investigators? Is, is there any kind of system they can go online and check, check these well, people are, are ethical? Sadly, sadly not, Mark. Um, um, you know, we, we've had that. We had somebody who um, contacted us uh, because there were some uh, experiences that she was having in her house. And um, she had young children. And I spoke to her and, you know, calmed her down and what have you. And we had a nice dialogue going. Anyway, then she'd spoken to another, um, they weren't a group, they were individuals. And um, they went round, straight round. Immediately they contacted. They were like round the house within an hour. And the next minute, there were photographs of the inside of her house up all over social media, uh, including photographs that were on the wall of her children, including photographs outside of the house and including the street sign. Now, in my book, that is completely unethical. That's the inside of somebody's private house. She said, yes, you can take photos, you know, blah, blah. And, um, but, you know, it was all over social media and she was very upset. So I think it's, you know, again, it's not about criticising these people, but it's just about being mindful. And as a group, we've got insurance to protect us against, um, you know, anything like that. We've got your public liability, you know, we've got our social media liability and, and uh, professional indemnity insurance and you know they are needed but I would hope that we will never have to ever claim off it or nobody would ever want to put a claim in against us but a lot of people do not have the insurances or or the policies to support what they're doing and again you know it's it's big business people you know I think if you have a look at paranormal investigators paranormal groups you know they're still popping up tenfold every single day new groups are coming on because it's the you know it's the in thing to do and they, they go as as quick as they come don't they Leanne you know and there's quite a few who have been stalwarts and have continued and you know we've got a good relationship with quite a few of them and you know they come and go but uh, yeah it's, it's you know people have to do it correctly this is people's lives you know it's people's homes people's businesses and we're quite happy that you know all the private investigations we do we do them privately we sign a confidentiality clause if then that uh, person or that uh, company wish then to disclose that information themselves that is entirely up to them when they get our report that's their report so they can do what they want with it but we would never publish it that's good. So, I mean, you, you're doing it. You're doing it because you'd you'd like to find the answers, not because you're after Facebook likes, like like some people or clicks or whatever that they're chasing. Yeah. And yeah. I th- I think it's also good. It kind of goes back to the dragging a bloke off the street to fix your roof analogy. But if you can see somebody has been doing this for ten, twenty years, they're probably more respectable than somebody who's just popped up last week, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, you know, Leanne and I. Um, we were with a, a you know a, a group previously and they had good ethics didn't they lee you know and um you know there are groups about who who do do it properly and you know certainly when the groups that are going on and they're they're doing the asset training etc they are learning about the ethical side of investigating which you know a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't really know or understand to be honest with you no and to, to be honest the, the, that is something the, the asset training side of it is something i thought would make a nice episode of this podcast at some point if you'd like to have a chat about that at some point because i i don't think many people really know what what that is at all and it's quite an important part i think for Certainly in the UK, isn't it for for people who? Oh yeah, doing these yeah, things. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you've you've got, you know, you've got the ASAP uh, training. You've got the, you know, Steve Parsons. He's a, a very well known um, ghost hunter, paranormal I- investigator. 
and, a, and a fellow Welshman. Absolutely. Well, he's not Welsh. He's, we've we've oh, inherited him. Sorry, Steve, we've inherited you. He's not <laughs> yes. Uh, he is now. <laughs> um, I think but if he wants to be. How then he would ever admit. Yeah. But, you know, when you, you've got Steve, and again, he's got the most fantastic ethics. And, you know, as a group, we had, uh, you know, a lot of us are ASAP trained, but what we, we had Steve then come and do his ghostology training with the wider group. And again, you know, it's, it's about the ethics. It's, you know, it's a lot of it is down to how you're acting and, and what have you. And, you know, they're, they're two good bases. And, you know, we would encourage anybody to look at ASAP and also to look at, at Steve and, and learn, you know, you can you can only take the information then, do whatever you want with it, but um, you know, see what they've got to offer. Yes. So yeah. on to the, the the Welsh questions then, because I don't want to keep you all night. But I, I I there's a quote on the back of my book, which I regret being there now, but it's it says that Wales is the most haunted place in the world, the most haunted country in the world. Now, that is based on some factors, like based on square mile and the amount of castles and things you and this, that, and the other. But in your experience, do you think Wales could lay claim to be in the most haunted country in the world? Yeah, I think possibly we could. I mean, um, if you look at like the number of, uh, you know, the number of castles, haven't we got the most castles? Well, that, that's, the yeah, that, that's what the maths was kind of based on, is yeah, that if, if you yeah, assume I'm every sure. castle is haunted and we've got more castles than anyone else, yeah, that's a lot of haunted castles. Yeah, it is. You know, there's a lot of old, you know, I, I know the Roman roads go throughout, but yeah, I mean, there's... there's um, there's a lot of places to investigate in Wales. Um, yeah, I, I think with that, um, just, you know, Wales is, is so steeped in history and we've got, we've still got lots of these old buildings around and landmarks around. And obviously we've got things that were built on top of other things, you know, even just around the corner, we've got Castle Cork, which is maybe only, you know, 150 years old, but it's built on a settlement that is hundreds of years prior to that. Um, so I, I quite well believe that, yeah, Wales could be one of the most haunted areas then in, in maybe in the UK. Excellent. So the next time set, someone asks me why it says that on my book, I can say, well, look, Cymru Paranormal agree with me. They've corroborated that Wales is the most haunted. If you had to pick your favourite supposedly haunted place in Wales, it doesn't have to be haunted, but if you had to pick one place in Wales to visit, what would your favourite be? And that's to the two of you. Oh, I think for myself, oh, there are so many places. Um, I think for myself, though, I personally feel quite connected to Lander. Just just the whole area, not even one particular building, but there's there's several sites around there and... Just the whole area, I think, is, is something quite special about it. Do you think that could have, because when I think of it, I think of Roald Dahl coming from there. Is that maybe why he was slightly dark in his literature? Um, I don't know. I, I, obviously, I know the association of Roald Dahl with Lander, but um, no, not so much for me. I think I've, I've been there so many times and I had so many varied experiences and there's so much history and, and so many sort of folklore stories and things with it there, there is just a some sort of connection there that i feel um so, certainly that would be my go-to location and th- that sounds like a good one as well for the for the current times because you don't need to book or to go inside somewhere in, in really do you? you can just turn up and wander yeah you need to know a little bit about the terrain if you go in there late at night uh you know in the dark as the nights draw in but yeah certainly it's an, an easy one that you can you can go to excellent and for you, Sarah? I think mine, to be honest with you, would have to be Clankayak Fowl. Yeah. I don't know. There's just something about that place. It's quite a mesmerising, I don't know, atmospheric building. Uh, it's quite simple as far as buildings go. But, yeah, there's there's something about there that um, sort of captivates me, to be honest with you. Uh, and again, you've got inside and you've got sort of outside the surrounding area that um, that is quite good. But yeah, from um, a location, from a building point of view, then yeah, that would be sort of my my favourite place. And uh, have you guys been there investigating or, or do you just mean you just sort of pop in as a as a tourist then? So we've investigated there a oh, number right. of times. 
yeah yeah and and again you know popping into places you know to investigate there's a lot of places mark that if you ask them can you do a paranormal investigation they would actually say no but there's a lot of places where um you can actually go uh, pay your ticket price to go in and you're on no time limit And you can sit and just take in all of the atmosphere and actually do an investigation and nobody actually knows what you're doing. So, yeah, you know, I would encourage that as well. Again, you know, be respectful. Can't sit there shouting out or pull out your Ouija board, etc. But, um, you know, again, you can get the atmosphere of, of the place. And, and do that it's not always about going you know turning up somewhere at nine o'clock at night until two o'clock in the morning you know think about what was uh, you know a lot of these older places as well they were all sleeping mm. um they'd be up early in the morning and then they'd, the house would be asleep wouldn't they early so be there in the day but uh yeah Flank Hayek would be my my sort of my go-to place but I agree with Leanne Glandaff is it's a fascinating place and it is it is you know very atmospheric it's a very interesting location I'm, I'm glad you said thank i for yours as well now because when i was researching my, my most recent book i got in touch with various places to to use photographs and things and at, like you said some places don't want to be involved with this at all and they're just like no don't 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 mention us nothing to do with it thank i they were the opposite they actually bent over backwards to help me and they're like yeah of course they, they sent me pictures and they arranged tours and all that stuff the only thing they asked me and maybe you you two can help me out a little bit here is they said don't give away all of our secrets so write about the ghost stories but don't give away everything because then people who go on the tours have got nothing to listen to. But if you yeah. investigated yeah. there, can you give me any uh, any sort of secret insider information of what you might have picked up, or what you did pick up on when you were there? So that's quite a lot, Lee, isn't there? Okay, if you yeah. pick a favourite then. We um, actually take some of the ghost tours round um, a while ago, um, so we're we're well aware of all the stories and things that are there. I think as well, you have to be careful. Sometimes stories get changed as they get told down the line. So we've always kind of, I suppose, whenever we've gone in there, we've allowed people to to experience for themselves, and then maybe mention the stories afterwards. Um, but yeah, there's there's so many experiences there, and a lot of them just during the day. Um, you know, as as people are just, they, um, if you know Frank Hayek at all, they actually uh, they dress in the same period uh, around 1645. Um, so they are not aware of mobile phones. They're not aware of you know current situations. Um, they very much stay in character all day long. Um, and yeah, you have lots of experiences there during the day. Um, things have been seen, things have been heard, there's been smells, things like that. So, yeah, it's a fascinating location. Excellent. Well, I hope, because like I said, I, I've got a soft spot f- for them there. So I hope people listening to this are going to think, yeah. that's where we're going to go. Yeah, right. and I'd, I'd say to anybody, you know, pop there in the day, have a look around. My my hint, don't hang about on the staircase. Actually, yeah, well, I, will, I won't spoil that for anyone either now. But yes, I did uh, pick up on the staircase uh, bits, but... Have you got something more to add to what people might know about the staircase? Well, you know, I wouldn't want to um, go into, you know, because what I'd like is, because with Lankayak, if anybody actually experiences anything in Lankayak, they do like you to let them know. And my very, very first experience in Lankayak was taking the children and we took uh, our two boys and their friends up there and it was over Halloween and it was half term and they do lots of, of or they did at that time, lots of sort of witch trials, etc. in that week. And we took them up, you know, the, the kids love that. And uh, we went on a tour and they were talking about everything. And, and then we were in this one room and had this really bizarre experience um, I turned to Martin, my husband, who's who's with us uh, as a, an investigator, and I, I said uh, to him what I'd experienced, and he sort of like just looked at me like, oh, you know, I'm so stupid, you know, and and I saw, and the man looked at me, and he must have been wondering, you know, well, what's what's she doing? And I was sort of like touching everything, and I was thinking, well, you know, did I experience that? You know, uh, is it what Martin's just said? And and I left there and I didn't tell them. 
So what I would say to anybody, no matter what you're doing in there, if you experience anything, let them know when you go back down and back into the reception area. Just let them know what time it was and what room you were in and what you experienced so that they can write it down so they've got uh, a log of what's actually happening. It's a very good way of doing it, isn't it? And and they won't laugh at you. They'll just record this and long term that could, well, who knows what it might lead to. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's probably why it is one of my favourite locations because, you know, I've had a couple of personal experiences there and, you know, more than a couple, to be honest with you. I've had quite a few experiences there a couple of things that could be explained immediately but i i would say i've probably got about four or five experiences in that building that i've never been able to explain well what, what i'll have to do then because i think i'm gonna have to do an entire episode on plan Gaiachvar now so you're gonna have to pop back on and tell me all about them assuming they don't mind us talking about them and uh, yeah tell everyone to go and visit yeah yeah absolutely it's a lovely place excellent and so wrapping things up because i know we've all got to sleep at some point as we're not on a ghost hunt tonight uh, <laughs> if anyone listening to this did want to know more from you guys whether they wanted to get in touch with a, a query or to join or whatever it is how can people go about doing that so look at our website www.cymryparanormal.com drop us an email or drop us a message on facebook email may be better because uh, we monitor them much more than we do on our Facebook page. Excellent. So you're quite easy to track down. Just do a search for Camry Paranormal or CamryParanormal.com and they'll find you. Yeah, put us in Google and we should come up, Camry Paranormal, and just look for the Red Dragon. Of course, of course. Yeah, the flag of Camry, yes. And on that note, I think, I think you two have just smashed the record for my longest episode ever. I think, I think I was on to sort of 40-odd minutes. I think this is going to go well over 40 minutes. So thank you very much for that... Uh, marathon and it was fascinating is there anything else you'd like to add before i let you go nothing from me mark as always it's a pleasure talking to you and um good luck with absolutely everything and we can't wait to read your book i'll make sure you both get a copy very soon lovely thank you both thanks mark speak soon and that really was a marathon so if i don't wrap this up soon we are going to be smashing the hour mark which is something i never thought i would do so as usual if you have enjoyed this episode please consider hitting the subscribe button if you have any comments to make you can track me down online it's quite easy to do on social media or my website just do a search for mark race put the word ghosts in or folklore or whales i will pop up on top And Camry Paranormal have just given me a great way of ending this episode because if music can be used, in theory, to communicate with ghosts, and if they have a taste for Sospen Vach, well, maybe those Llanelli ghosts have a taste for Sospen Vach, well, let's give that a go at the end of this episode. And I've tracked down this little sample which has been made available thanks to the Creative Commons license by the very lovely people at Sign Records, or Sign Recordiae, the Welsh language record label Sign, have made this available so I can use it. So thank you to them for that. And I will include a link on my website if anyone else wanted to go and get their hands on this recording. And it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian and Grando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best. It's the beautiful. It's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And to sing us out, here's a little Sospen Vach. And while this is playing, listen carefully to see if anything does try and communicate with us. Until next time, no star. Hello? Anyone there? Tap once for yes and two for no. And we'll see if... No. Well, that's that's an unexpected reply. Let's, let's try Sospanvach one more time, shall we? And leave you in peace. <laughs>